Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Vineyard. My name is Paul. And I am Amy. Uh, we are small group leaders here in the church. And this morning we are obviously here with you leading the service. Um, we are so glad that you are here with us today where as a church we are all about following Jesus, living life to the full and making a difference. So we're looking forward to worshipping together uh, this morning and we're going to hear a really encouraging talk. We're going to have some space to respond to God after at the end as well. Um, you might have seen as you came in this morning that um, we do ask you to wear a face covering when you are with us in the building. So if you are able to do that um, and you're doing that, we just thank you so much for that. Well, here at Birmingham Vineyard, we love to start our services with a time of sung worship. So if you are able, would you mind just going ahead and standing up um, as we prepare um, to worship? Um, worship is just a chance for each and every one of us to encounter and worship and praise God. Um, and so as we start, I just want to read um, Psalm 89, verses 1 and 2. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your faithfulness. Father, we thank you so much that... Um, our relationship with you doesn't depend on how we feel about your love. It isn't dependent on our faithfulness to you. Father, it is your love and your faithfulness. And Father, I pray that as we um, declare your love and your faithfulness and your gratefulness this morning, that we will come to know your love for us in a brand new way. Amen. Buried beneath my shame, who could carry that car away? It was my tomb till I met.
God, we thank you for the freedom to come into your presence. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here together. We thank you that when we come into your presence, that we are welcomed with grace. God, that you have the power to change our hearts, to change our minds, to change our circumstances. And we bring all those things to you today, God, and say, have your way, God. Have your way, God. Thank you. guys for leading us in worship. Keep those things in your heart that God's working on that's speaking to you. We'll, we'll have time to deal with those later. Um, we're going to deal, uh, we're going to have a minute's break now. Um, if you're in the room with us, maybe turn around and say hi to someone. Um, if you're watching us on the online chat, why not say where you're worshipping from today? Good morning. Hello. Um, another big welcome to you. It is so great to have you with us today. Um, if it's your first time here, 
Um, as Amy says, we are so glad that you're here with us, joining us, and we would love to invite you to grab one of these purple bags, if you haven't already. Um, and it's full of great stuff to help you um, as you're um, exploring the church, exploring your journey of faith, finding a bit more. Um, if you're online, there'll be a link on the screen or the QR code in the purple bag. Um, that will, uh, If you scan that, it will take you through to the same form you can fill in if you're clicking the link online. Uh, and if you can fill in your details, then one of our friendly team will connect with you and say hi and um, yeah, engage with you a little bit more about what's going on in the church. Well, there are um, a couple events coming up that we just want to let you know about. Um, and the first one is um, our encounter night. The next one is going to be this Saturday night um, at 7.30 p.m. right here in, um, at our city center site. Um, these have been really, really great monthly spaces to come, um, just rest unhurriedly, be together, and encounter God through worship, through prayer, it's a chance to glorify him, and it's a chance to come together corporately um, and just intercede on things that are happening in our nation. You don't have to book on or sign up ahead of time. Just show up, and we would love to encounter God together with you. Um, if you are here and you are married, uh, whether it's been less than a year or five decades, we would love to invite you to spend some time um, this spring investing in your relationship through the Loving Your Marriage course, which starts on the 31st. Um, there's going to be six sessions of teaching and group discussion on Zoom, uh, plus some ideas for homework and date nights in between, and then a meal uh, together at the end of the course to celebrate. Um, it costs £25 per couple uh, for all the materials, resources and food. But if, there are any, uh, uh, if that cost is a barrier to you, uh, do let us know and we can um, speak about some other options available. Um, so if you'd like to find out more about that, um, go to bbc.so slash marriage course to sign up or email becky at birminghamvineyard.com for more information. Yeah, um, Paul and I have never done one of these um, courses, but we've read the book that it's, it's based on. We found some really, really great helpful tools in it, and so we feel really confident that this will be a helpful session to others. Well, like we said earlier, one of, um, or what we are about as Birmingham Vineyard is following Jesus, living life to the full, and making a difference. And um, sometimes that making a difference is what we do corporately as a church, but also it's about how each of us as individuals in this church are making a difference. And we have loved time on Sunday mornings to see and hear firsthand how our church and how people in our church are doing just that, how they're making a difference. And so today, uh, Lauren Smith, um, not Smith, Lauren Morris, who is our kids and family coordinator, is talking with L. Smith, um, who is a part of South Sight. Um, and they're going to be talking about how L. has seen our stay and play ministry make a difference. So let's see about that now. Hi, L. Lovely to Hi. see you today. And Zach. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So we're here today to uh, talk about Stay and Play. So Elle, what made you want to come along to Stay and Play every week? Um, well, it's something that I've always wanted to do um, ever since Grow Baby first launched. But being a teacher, working full time, my Fridays just weren't available for that. So when this little one came along um, and being on maternity leave, it meant that I had a different rhythm to life and a different routine. And yeah, my Fridays were available to to come and join in and to do stay and play which yeah it's really great yeah wonderful we'd love to have you what have been some of your favorite memories from your times uh, coming along um well one of the best things was actually on the first week um we got all set up we were all ready to go um and in walked one of my colleagues, um, which was amazing. I had no idea she would be there. Um, she, I knew she'd had a baby, but um, I, yeah, I had no idea that she would be there or even that she lived in the local area. Um, so that was so lovely to see her. Um, and yeah, we've just been able to build a relationship. Prior to this, she was kind of an acquaintance. Not, uh, like we got on fine, but I didn't really know her. Um, but yeah, we've just been able to build a much deeper friendship um, and talk about stuff that we would never have done at work. Um, yeah, which has been really great. Yeah, that's really amazing. So how would you say that Stay and Play is part of our, our vision here at Birmingham Vineyard to follow Jesus, live life to the full and make a difference? Um, I mean, I think it's really following Jesus' example. Um, I think if Jesus was walking around here today on earth that's where he would be he would be hanging out with 
the, the parents and the kids and people who don't normally come to church mm. um, and he would just be loving them and getting to know them and, and yeah and so it's just a really great way to show them Jesus's love um, and to make a real difference in building community around people who don't necessarily have much community around them um, yeah <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And off the back of that, what would you say to parents or carers or anyone really who have the opportunity to come to stay and play? What would you say to them? Oh, absolutely come. It's so much fun. You you get to hang out with awesome kids and play games. And it's just, it's so much fun. And getting to know the parents as well. It's, yeah, it's, it's really brilliant. Definitely come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, woohoo! Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Elle, and uh, <laughs> see you soon. Bye, Zach. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Well, that was sweet and encouraging, wasn't it? Um, I know that Lauren would love to um, have more people as part of her team. So if you are available on Friday mornings and would love to get to know local um, parents and carers in the community, um, if you would like to hang out some, with some really sweet, bouncy children, um, or if you are a parent or a carer and you would like to learn more about this space, um, you can get in touch with Lauren to learn more. You can get in touch with her through um, our office, the church office. Um, she's actually here this morning. She's upstairs with the kids. Um, and she, I think she does want to be down here after so you can look for her. Um, Rob and Wendy, who are with us this morning, are part of the, um, the Stay and Play team as well. I know they would love to answer any questions. Um, so let's just pray for our Stay and Play ministry. Father, we thank you so much for this really unique opportunity we have to be your hands and feet right here um, in our own backyard um, and to parents and carers um, in the city as well. Father, we pray that, pray that this would be more than just a Friday morning play group, but that it would be a space where those who enter encounter you and your love and your peace. And Father, we pray that real deep community would form as well, and through relationships, people would come to know your love. Amen. Amen. Um, so today we're looking forward to hearing from Jo Ramsasia, um, one of the site pastors here at the morning service, as she continues our sermon series on Encounters with Jesus. Um, if you'd find it helpful to follow along, uh, there are some um, sermon notes at the back by the Purple Bags. But otherwise, over to you, Jo. Thank you. Hi. Morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Oh, I've got some waves. That's lovely. Um, <clears throat> For the podcast, I'm Jo, one of the site pastors here at Central Site. I'm really excited to be talking to you um, in this series that we've got on encounters with Jesus because, you know, every single encounter with Jesus, both in the script scriptures and in our lives, is, is exciting and life-changing and life-giving. And so today we're going to look at an encounter in um, John 3, 1 to 21, with a, a Pharisee called Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night for a private conversation. You know, when I sat down to prepare this talk, and I started praying about it, it just really, really struck me that the same Jesus who was there 2,000 years ago, having this conversation with Nicodemus, is the same Jesus as is here with us now. And it just really prompted me to say this prayer. So would you just pray along with me now? That would be great. So Jesus, you were there with the man in this conversation we're about to read about. You remember it, Lord. You remember that conversation. What would you have us learn from that conversation today? Lord, thank you that the same way as you saw Nicodemus come out of the dark night into the light of your presence and you knew exactly what he needed to hear from you at that time. Lord, you know what each one of us needs to know from you this morning. Um, Lord, would you teach us and open our hearts to what you may want to say to us, regardless of what I, as a, as a preacher, may explicitly say or not say. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. Lead us. Amen. So
So let's have a look at the passage. I'm, I'm going to read the passage through. It's the word of God. Um, from 1 to, through to 21, this whole encounter and what John, who was writing about this, had to say about it. So it says, Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time in their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we, we testify to what we've seen. And still you people don't accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then are you going to believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now here come those verses that we all know so well and love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the one in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done and what has been done in the sight of God. Wow. That's that's mind-blowing conversation, isn't it? And and just it just amazing. But what might that conversation have meant to Nicodemus two thousand years ago? And what does that mean to us now? So we know that Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. Um, so. If you read the gospel accounts, you'll know that these are the guys that Jesus has the most trouble with. Um, they're constantly questioning him and condemning him, actually, in his actions. And they're the ones that he calls the brood of vipers in Matthew 12, 34. They're kind of the bad guys. But even so, one of them, Nicodemus, plucks up the courage to go and visit Jesus, albeit at night, unofficially, presumably no one else knows he's there. Um, but he's seen something about Jesus, hasn't he? Here he is. He is one of the, the... He's like the national leadership of Vineyard. You know, he's right at the top. He knows all the scriptures. He knows it all. But Jesus has captivated him. And he thinks there's something else. And the first words 
show that he's here to learn and not to criticize. He calls Jesus, uh, Jesus rabbi, which is teacher. He says, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God. Now, who's we? Not the Sanhedrin. They're always questioning this. Is, is, is Nicodemus counting himself among the believers, albeit in private and not in public? <laughs> Maybe he's not ready to own his own opinion yet. But Jesus sees him as he does all of us, and sees his heart, and immediately knows where to direct this conversation. Um, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Who wants to see the kingdom of God? Put your hands up. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, so... <laughs> What does it look like? What does the kingdom of God look like? Turn to the person next to you, or if you're online, write it in the chat, and tell them what we might expect to see or not see in the kingdom of God. Okay, so what would we see? What are we going to see? What are we going to see in the kingdom of God? Compassion. Compassion. Peace. Peace. Joy. Joy. Justice. Justice. Life. Life. Righteousness. 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 Healing. Healing. Oh. Who's seen, who has seen the kingdom of God operating in their lives? Who has seen that? Ah, okay. Who would really, really like more? Who would like more of that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we are hungry for more, aren't we? And I think Jesus saw that Nicodemus was hungry for more too. And that's why he led him into this teaching. And you know, it's not surprising that we just have this real desire in our hearts to see that and to see that happening because this is the calling on our lives as human beings. You know, before the fall... When we were first commissioned by God in the Garden of Eden, God said, you know, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over every living thing. God wanted his kingdom on earth, which was in the Garden of Eden, to fill the earth. And he gave us the responsibility and the authority to do that as human beings. That's why we, that's why we so want it. But, you know, we messed it up and turned away from God and had to leave Eden, where his kingdom ruled. But Jesus is here showing us that we have a second chance. Okay, so he says, if we want to see the kingdom of God, we must be born again. And he goes on to explain this. He says we must be born of water and the spirit. Now, this would make Nicodemus think about the account of creation in Genesis, uh, and, and new life on earth. That's what he would be thinking about as, as, a, as, as a scholar. It might make us think about those two baptisms that we receive as believers, the baptisms of, of water, which is a, a, a physical and public declaration that we're joining the community of believers, leaving our old life behind and dying with Christ and rising up to new life in him, and a baptism of the Holy Spirit, where we receive the new life of the Spirit welling up in us like a spring of water, reconnecting our spirits with the Spirit of God, giving us access to him and his kingdom. We die to our old selves and we're reborn into new life in Christ. And Jesus says this, he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going, and so it is of everyone born of the Spirit. And now that this is a play on words because the word for wind in Greek and Hebrew is the same as the word for spirit. But notice how Jesus is connecting our spiritual lives with something that we can't physically see, but you can see the effects of. That's because when we're connected to God's spiritual kingdom, when we're born again as citizens of heaven, like we were singing about this morning. We are moved directly by heavenly things and not the earthly things. So Jesus is telling Nicodemus that if we're born again or recreated, we expect to be moving in the power of the Spirit in the same way 
that Jesus is, was. And seeing the kingdom of heaven coming on earth as it is in heaven, just as he did. So if we're really born again, who would count themselves as born again? Who would count themselves as born again? Yeah, okay. If we're born again, born of the Spirit, why don't we see these signs of the kingdom of God as Jesus showed us as a normal part of our everyday lives? Why don't we see more? Well, Jesus directs Nicodemus to the way he thinks. You know, don't you understand? The way we think is a really, really big part of this. It's our mindset and what we have our minds fixed on. You know, Paul says in Romans 8, 5, those who live according to their flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. So the earthly mindset says this. It says you need your life to look a certain way, to follow a certain pattern, to achieve certain things in life in order to be worthy and acceptable and significant and secure. And if we're not careful, even if we are born again, we can spend our whole lives trying to achieve what the world wants us to achieve in order to be acceptable to ourselves and to those around us. Or even sometimes we work really hard at at worldly things to be acceptable to God. But you know what? Um, A heavenly mindset says, you are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Jesus has qualified you and you're already completely worthy, perfectly acceptable to God, but also created with kingdom purpose, significant kingdom purpose and destiny with access to any resources you may need for that through our really, really generous God. Being born again means we need to change the way we think about ourselves and what is possible. Does that mean that we get it right straight away? No, of course not, because we're learning to walk in our new life in Christ. You know, I really love watching my granddaughters learning to walk. It just gives me such delight. Just just have a look at this. Have a look at this little clip. (laughs) Go, go, go. (laughs) Go, go, go. Is it a bit hard with these long pajamas (laughs) on? Yeah, where are your feet going? (laughs) Are you a bit tired as well? You can try again. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> oh, so sweet. Uh, it's just lovely, isn't it? They, they practice and they practice and they, they love to bounce. You know, if, you, if you're a parent or a grandparent or you, you're around, you, you know your arms are going to ache because of the bouncing. They stretch their muscles. They find anything to climb on, don't they? Anything that's available to pull up on and, and practice. And, you know, when they then start to try and walk on their own, they fall down, don't they? And, uh, you know, they, they learn to pick themselves up. And when they fall down and they don't do it straight away, does that make them <laughs> unworthy of walking? <laughs> no, of course not. And, you know, how do their parents see them or their grandparents see them when they're, when they're learning? We absolutely delight in their attempts. And you know that, how we feel when we see those little ones taking their first steps. That's how the Father feels about us when we're taking our baby steps in the kingdom and in kingdom stuff. And just as I'm so completely confident that little Flossie will soon be running around um, independently, um, so does God watch us with that same attitude. He, he knows what we can do. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what we're capable of as we learn to step out and be Christ-like. You know, did you, 
Did you maybe pray for someone for healing and nothing happened? Does that mean that that's not accessible to you? No, of course not. We practice it and we do according to what we know is true, even when we don't see it. Jesus says to Nicodemus, we speak about what we know and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people don't accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How will you believe me when I speak of heavenly things? You know, I know that when I see places where God's people really seem to have accessed the gates of heaven, you know places, I'm thinking of places like, you may or may not have heard of these places, like Cold Rain where Mark Marks um, began his healing on the streets ministry, or Reading in California where Bill Johnson just sees amazing breakthroughs in the miraculous, even Anaheim where John Wimber first established the Vineyard Church and uh, and and just established this idea of everyone gets to play. We all get to be empowered with the Spirit. And we all get to be part of those kingdom miraculous things that happen. You know, one thing that is common with all of these, these places is their heavenly mindset. That's what they have in common. They accepted the first-hand testimonies of, and stories of Jesus and his disciples as true and accessible for us now and pushed in with eyes fixed on what was above, not the immediate results of what was below. Did these guys get the results they now see straight away? No. But instead of getting discouraged, giving up, or even, this is something that we do, we make up a new theology about <laughs> why things weren't happening... They remain fixed on the heavenly truths, not the sort of the half life that mankind created out of being disconnected with God. That's not what we were made for. We were made for the heavenly stuff. And we sometimes think of it the other way around. As they remain fixed on the things of heaven, their minds were transformed into a heavenly mindset. And they knew that what was available to Christ was available to them. So, you know, the biggest struggle when our growth into Christ-likeness is not our personality type, and it's not our circumstances, and it's not even our past. It's our mindset. That's where we need to see the growth. You know, Jesus gave us this really, really beautiful encouragement in John 14, 12. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever... Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Whoever believes in me. Was Jesus a liar? No. That means he means you. He's not a liar. He means you. So how... Is this possible? This is what we were always meant for. But you know, our sinful nature cut us off from this inheritance that we were created, created for in the first place. But God created a way back to what we were originally called to do, to grow his kingdom on earth. And Jesus explains this to Nicodemus. This is what he says to this guy who only knows the Old Testament. Okay, think about it. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, he's referring to an incident that happens in Numbers 21, 5 to 8, but also prophetically directing Nicodemus to what's going to happen to him on the cross. You know, perhaps Jesus knew that he was going to be there. In Numbers, the Israelites had been moaning again. They were always moaning, weren't they? moaning again. And the Lord sent venomous snakes to punish them. And when Moses asked the Lord what to do, he told him, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. So a bronze snake that represented the evil that had invaded the Israelite camp was put on a wooden pole. And the Israelites only had to look at the snake and they were healed of the effect of snake bites. You know, you sometimes see a sign, don't you, of a snake in medical things, of a snake on a pole. 
There you go. In the same way, John explains, God gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus, on a wooden cross, represented that fatal evil that we've allowed into our lives, which is us, really, and our decisions. As sinful humans, we were cut off from God by our own choices to go our own way and want to be in charge of our own lives and do what we wanted to do. Left on our own devices, we were already condemned because of our choices, not, not God's punishment, because of our choices, what we've chosen, where we've chosen to be. But we don't, we don't have to earn our way back into heaven. You know, in fact, it's actually impossible to do that. We just have to look up at Jesus on the cross and believe that what he's doing what needs to be, is, is what needs to be done to restore us to eternal life. We have to repent and believe. Repent literally means turning around your thinking, changing our mindset. Stop seeing ourselves as the answer to our problems or anything else. And start seeing Jesus as the answer to our problems. We're like the snakes causing havoc in the Israelite camp. Jesus takes our likeness on the cross, cuts us off from the consequences of our sin. We just have to look at him, repent, and believe. John ends this passage with this verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they've done and what's uh, done has been done in the sight of God okay can we turn the lights off a minute right off oh, it's so dark you know you could be picking your nose and no one would know. Okay, let the lights come on again. Whoa, whoa. They're so bright, they hurt your eyes. You kind of feel exposed. And then they come back to normal. Okay. And you know, we often have the lights in here on a comfortable, not quite full, but not quite dark. Some people don't find that comfortable. Some people don't like that. But that's, that's what we do here. It's kind of that's the comfortable, not quite full. You know, I, I think our lives can be a little bit like that. Do we feel comfortable with a certain amount of darkness so those rough edges in our lives aren't fully exposed? You know that person who we don't want to really want to forgive or that ungodly habit we don't want to give up because it brings us a comfort that quite frankly we don't really believe that God can replace you know we're comfortable with the earthly perspective we don't want to repent into the heavenly one because we don't think it will quite stack up we can be born again but not fully connected with, to the kingdom of heaven because we don't choose to be and, you know, we always do have a choice. We always have a choice. Because being born again means that your old self, who was a slave to the desires of this world, is dead. They are gone. The enemy will tell you the lie that you can't kick this habit or forgive or change because you're wired that way. But that isn't true. It might have been once. But, you know, that person is dead and you are a new creation. It's a matter of repenting, of changing your mindset about yourself, not believing the lies anymore. If you really are Jesus' disciples, he tells us in John 8.32, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So how will we respond? You know, Nicodemus stepped out of the dark of night and into the light of truth that Jesus taught him on that night. He went on to stand up for Jesus in a discussion with the, in the Sanhedrin 
when they were wanting to condemn him. And then he was the one, Nicodemus was the one with Joseph of Arimathea who bought spices to embalm Jesus' body after the crucifixion. His encounter with Jesus at night literally led him to the cross. We see him gradually become more and more public with his belief in Jesus. That was quite dangerous for him. He went on a journey from darkness into light. And we're all called on that journey. But you know, being born again is a, is a part of that journey and it's not the end of it. Some encounters with Jesus are immediately, dramatically life-changing changing for us. Like a miraculous um, healing or, or provision like the, what John was talking about last week, the wine, water into wine, or deliverance from a, a fear or an oppression. But some are more gradual encounters that open our eyes to a different reality, that set us on a different path to a different destination to the one we started from, a bit like this one with Nicodemus. Now, whether our experiences of Jesus are super dramatic or lead us to a repentance in just one area of our thinking, we need to continue to step into all that God has for us so that really can be part of his kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. And this, this might mean that we need to turn our thinking around again today. To repent from one particular earthly mindset into a heavenly one. How is Jesus asking, asking you to respond today? Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you for that, that um, conversation that you had with Nicodemus. And I thank you that it was not just a conversation with Nicodemus, but it's also a conversation with us. Lord, you ask us to see things in a heavenly way. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do that. Help us to repent. Help us to understand what it is to be more like you and to walk in your footsteps and to have access to the things that you ha have access to. Lord, if there's any way, Holy Spirit, would you come now? If there's anything in our thinking that would stop us from accessing what you would have us access, Lord, would you reveal that to us now and in the next few moments? Just really ask that in your name. Amen. Sing songs, Father. Just flood me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come quickly. Yeah. 
give some time and space for people to respond um, to what they've heard, to what they felt today. I just had the sense as well as, as, as Joe was saying, Nicodemus kind of snuck in at night and had, had not kind of made his, um, his beliefs about Jesus public yet. And we want to give space to anyone here who might feel um, they've been drawn to Jesus. Um, they've been enticed to Jesus they've been intrigued to Jesus and they haven't kind of made that step of, of kind of publicly um, declaring that that is the person they want to follow so we want to live um, some space um, and some time for people to to make that commitment now so if that is you um, I would just invite you to in your hearts to pray along um, with me now Lord Jesus I have I have heard of you, I've heard your teaching, I've heard the things you've got to share and I want to follow you, Jesus. I want my life to look like your life. I want to follow you for the rest of my days. I want to repent from the things I've done that I know are wrong 
and live life to the full, just as you've shown us. Lord Jesus, I welcome you into my heart and into my life. If you've done that for the first time, we would love it if you would share that with one of us after. We have some, um, some materials and things we can give you just to help as you explore what does that mean, um, this, this decision you've made for the rest of life. So do connect with us if that's you. And we also had the sense um, that maybe there are people in the room that haven't experienced the, that kind of spiritual baptism that Joe referred earlier and, and don't know what that means, don't know what that feels like. And we would love the chance to pray that over you as well. This is not a, a scary thing. This, when the Spirit comes upon um, us, it, people react in different ways. Sometimes people um, have a kind of really visible physical reaction and sometimes people have a sense of warmth or comfort and people react in different ways and that is totally fine. But we would love for you to just pray uh, with you to experience that, that kind of presence of God that you've never really had before. The easiest way for us to do that, if you're comfortable, is to is to kind of come to the front. There's some space here and we will have people um, who are experienced in praying and we'll kind of keep distance as much as you're kind of comfortable with, as much as the labels on your um, that you've got at work. So if, if that is you, we would love to just invite you to um, the sides at the front here and we'll have people available to pray with you. Bye to the um, to the stream now. Thank you so much for joining us. If you would like prayer um, about anything, there are a team on the chat who can do that. So do click that um, uh, request prayer button and get um, get some prayer for that. Um, but yeah, we'll say bye to the stream. But we'll continue here in the room as well.